your interviews with Brian Chesky, I learned a lot from those episodes, actually. Me too. Also, I liked his idea that like they were going to only ship the number of features he could keep in his brain and that his yeah. brain would be the maximum you know size yeah. of the canvas so if if I, I can't if one person can't keep all these changes in their brain let's put those changes into the next six month cycle i thought that was pretty yeah, yeah. Awesome i actually as well. borrowed a heuristic from there adapted it for our company which was if the person building the feature doesn't know how to write the code for it mm. they're very good programmers but if they're finding it a hard time to break it down and actually implement it then it's not worth shipping this week in startups is brought to you by crowdbotics Great ideas can change the world, and Crowdbotics is the fastest way to turn those ideas into code. Get a free scoping session for your next big app idea at crowdbotics.com slash twist. Vanta. Compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Twist listeners can get $1,000 off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. And... OpenPhone brings your team's business calls, texts, and contacts into one delightful app that works anywhere. Get 20% off your first six months at openphone.com slash twist. All right, everybody, welcome back to the program. We have been having an amazing array of founders who are taking on the challenges of implementing AI in the real world. And today will be no different. Uh, we have our Unvind. Shrin Ivas on the program. He's the founder and CEO of Perplexity AI. Welcome to the program, Aravind. Do you have a nickname or you go by Aravind? Aravind is good. Thank you for Aravind's. having me here, Jason. Uh, great to have you. And um, listen, you there's a big battle going on between Chat GPT and Bard, and you're right in the middle of that. You are doing Perplexity AI, correct? Uh, and you are trying to compete with these two giant, you know, software developers, tell us a little bit about how that's going and how you see perplexity.ai, which you can go check out right now, you the interface will look familiar. How do you plan on competing with them? And how is that going? Yeah, so firstly, we, uh, we started off a week after ChatGPT came out, we put it out. And there was a lot of difference at that time, which is we were just a search bar and we gave direct answers with citations uh whereas chat gpt was this entertaining hallucinatory bot that was not not just you know like correct many times but it was also equally wrong many times and its mistakes were also entertaining right so we focused a lot more on revamping search realizing that you know 10 years from now no one's going to be asking for 10 blue links you're going to ask for answers so mm -hmm. we might as well start it today and the technology for that was ready. Uh, both ChatGPT and us were basically being powered by GPT 3.5. Uh, that was the fundamental breakthrough. And then after that, GPT 4, even better than that. So that's kind of how it started. And we were seen pretty different. It's like, oh, you know, if ChatGPT lies or makes up, makes up things, there's this other side called perplexity. You go there and like, it's going to be this boring, educated uncle kind of product. But useful and you can trust it and that's kind of how we grew and then bard came out um i believe bard still hasn't solved the fake news problem completely um it, it does hallucinate and it doesn't actually have like real citations sometimes mm. um so we we are better than bard in that in, in the context of search but google's also rolling out this thing called magi or they call it search generative experience to the public but uh, the Wall Street Journal called it Magi. Um, so they're, they're trying to do something pretty similar to us. And so far, the experience, at least from what I've seen and my, myself used that and other people who have used that is, it's not very different from the way they used to extract text from the top link and put it mm. at the top. It's not very different from what they've already done before. Um, and they cannot afford to use really powerful models. So like, the search traffic that they have and if they actually want to really get it right but, uh, in the actual search bar itself outside of bar they're going to lose a ton of revenue hmm. yeah so they have two challenges there and so do, have you done a crawl of the web because you are giving citations 
and you Correct. do have a language model behind this. Yeah. So tell us what is underneath the hood here, because I have yeah. been saying, hey, if you're going to get a bunch of information and present it to me in a beautiful, uh, you know, answer with bullet points and numbers, uh, like perplexity just did for me, I asked it, hey, what are activities I should do with my s seven year olds? And uh, they like cities and the outdoors. And it gave me four popular uh, destinations for cities and four popular destinations outside. Really good suggestions, really tightly summarized. And then at the bottom, it said, hey, and then here are three citations, uh, TripAdvisor, US News, Family Vacationist, and Today, the Today Show. Um, so what's underneath the hood here? Yeah. How is it generating the answer? Yeah. So LLMs are these great reasoning engines. Uh, you throw you, you throw a lot of text at them and tell them what to do with it, and they'll do it for you. Um, and then there's the other part that's great, which is having a good index and a rank, ranked version of the index, which is a traditional search engine. And what we do, where we come in, is we combine the two together. We say, hey, like, LLMs are great. We'll figure out what content to throw at them for a given query, and we'll instruct them on how to actually uh, take all the text that's thrown at them in the context of the query and get the needles from the haystack and present it in the right format to the user. So they're doing more of the reasoning job. They're not actually doing um, pulling up actual facts that's been stored in the LLM itself because some of them could be right, some of them could be wrong. The real actual facts are in your web pages. So that's the content that we want to take. And we have like our own index and also like we rely on other index providers. And we collate from multiple different indexes, multiple different crawls of the web and pull up the relevant links, and then we ask the LLM to do all the reasoning on top, and then we give you the answer. Now, the magic is that all this happens so fast. We've put out the product in December, and back then, uh, the latency used to be like five to six, six seconds per query. In fact, one of our investors, Daniel Gross, he used to joke uh, to me saying, you should call it submit a job and not a submit a query. It's that slow. And now it's like almost as fast as Google, like you're hardly waiting. Um, you're, you're, the summary is like, really generated really quickly. And we still have like, you know, so much more room to improve there. And I think at, at some point, you're just going to take answers as the de facto search experience. That's kind of what we want to bring together. And, and our primary like superiority over the existing products is the speed at which we deliver these really accurate, well collated answers from so many different sources. And so, but you are built off of today, ChatGPT 4, correct? Yes, we heavily use ChatGPT 3.5 and 4. And we also use a little bit of our own LLMs for many other things. We have every question you ask on our site, you see a few related questions that are being popped up, right? That's actually one of the favorite parts of the product for many of our users because they like asking more. And that is sort of generated with our own LLM, for example. So there are and some parts of the product that yeah. we use our LLMs, but uh, I would say like most of the heavy lifting is being done with uh, OpenAI's LLMs right now. And so you added right now, does that mean you plan on building your own? Um, because it does seem like you're directly in competition with Bing. Bing has the partnership with ChatGPT before, so it's almost like you're yeah. both using the same underlying technology. Correct. They already have some scale, so that that uh, would be a difficult race there. So how yeah. do you look at ChatGPT's four's relationship or OpenAI's relationship and yeah. uh, Microsoft's access to it. I think we just need to win by building a superior product. There is just no other way. And I believe so far we have done that. We have not won against them, but they, they still have a lot of distribution through Windows devices. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people just go to Edge and they, st they can start using Bing Chat. Um, but people have, despite that, won against Microsoft in the past. Like they Google. Everyone went and searched for Chrome as the first search query on like Internet Explorer to install it. We all did that despite the friction they added. Um, so there's one way, there's only one way to win against the person who has much more distribution than you, which is a superior product. Now about using the same underlying technology, it is the case today. Uh, the reason is they have the best models and there's still a lot of differentiation you can have in how you harness the power of these models. These are mm. so general purpose machines. It's almost like you buy the engine from somewhere, but you're building um, a whole car with a lot of different parts and you can still build a better car. Um, and if it is the case that OpenAI is just going to be the number one place by far, 
and you want to give the best product to your users, uh, you do need to use their model. Like th there is no, um, like, like you can say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to use my own model because I don't want to use someone else's. But then if the search experience is pretty shit compared to what you have with OpenAI, you don't, you're not going to get users. And then you build your own modes or differentiation in other ways that just the person owning the LLM cannot build a, as good competitive product as yours. So if just the LLM is the only reason this is working, we, we don't have a chance. But that's not the case here. There are so many other things needed to be done to give you this experience where there's real-time facts being pulled up and presented in the right manner, uh, super fast, reliable, and like make the product engaging. So all that also matters. So for example, with, uh, people have done comparisons between us and Bing. And um, you know we have like much better accuracy in terms of how correctly we cite things. A lot of academic research has been done there. Uh, people spend on an average like two minutes more on our site than Bing. Uh, so that engagement is much better there. So our bounce rates are much lower than Bing. So basically, we only lack in one thing, which is number of views on the site. Hmm. But that can only be addressed if we're given sufficient time to grow and like make people aware of us. All right. We all know the one thing that separates great startups from the good ones is product velocity. What does it mean, product velocity? Fancy term, right? You got your product and you have velocity, speed. The speed in which your product improves. So can you ship updates? Can you release new features? Can you do bug fixes? Can you iterate on the interface? Can you solve problems for your customers? And can you do it quickly? Because you're not alone. You have competitors and your customers have choices. They may fit solve their problems by writing their own custom code, or they might use your solution. This is what startups are about. How fast can you get that product velocity going? And so, you know, how, you, how do you supercharge it? Everybody says, okay, yeah, we want to go faster, but you got to go faster intelligently. And Crowdbotics is going to help you do that. They're your CTO as a service. Basically, they provide you with the most optimal architecture to get your product to market as fast as possible. You'll have access to an on-demand product manager and developer talent, and they will help get your app into production 10 times faster than conventional development. Crowdbotics can work with your in-house dev team, or you can just have them work independently. And you own all the IP, you own all the source code, let the folks at Crowdbotics supercharge your product velocity today, no more waiting, get a free build plan at crowdbotics.com slash twist. That's a $4.99 value just for the twist listeners, you get that for free. That's C-R-O-W-D-B-O-T-I-C-S dot com slash twist for a free build plan. How do you um, get the citations? If you were asking this query I just did about like, hey, what cities? Mm -hmm. Should I take my seven years old to and then what outdoor locations? How do you actually get the citations? Because ChatGPT4, they, they don't provide citations? Um, yeah. Or do they? They have this thing called a browser plugin, um, uh -huh. which is basically powered by Bing. Mm. Uh, but people hate that experience in the sense it's really slow and clunky. Uh, yeah, it is slow and clunky, yeah. And um, so how do we do the citations? We basically pull up the relevant links to your query. Uh, from a search index. And then hmm. we combine that and tell the LLMs to write the answer. We, we basically ask the LLMs to go read all those links hmm. and then pull up the relevant paragraphs from each of those links and then make an answer out of whatever you thought was relevant. But write down the answer as if an academic or a journalist would write it, where each part of the answer ah. has the corresponding citation, like Wikipedia. You basically say, hey, like, I want you to do the job of what a human does on Wikipedia, where when they're writing uh, something about a new person or a new phenomenon or a new city, this is basically going and like uh, picking up a lot of web links about that, um, sifting through them and reading them and then coming back and writing an essay on it, right? So that whole human labor, intelligence needed to do that, is being automated now. Mm. All of this happening in like seconds, right? That's yeah. worth like hours of human labor. And that's the value we're actually adding to everybody. Got it. And so you collect all those links, give all those articles, and then give the, the summary yeah. of them. We basically and instruct the LLM to like, hey, behave like a Wikipedia person. Just, just write it like this. So the core of this is prompt engineering and knowing how to prompt engineer um, yeah. for different types of queries. Because different queries might require Correct. a Wikipedia editor. Other ones might me need a more Correct. of a sensibility of a journalist. And the LLM knows the difference between those things? You need to make it know. That's ah. the skill there. 
And, and 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 you're right. Prompt engineering is a big part of it. Um, but prompt it, 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 just because somebody might have your prompt doesn't change much, actually. Like prompts can leak. Mm. Uh, so it's all about orchestrating the backend, uh, the com- making it work with the right sources too. Mm. Um, so there, you know, there's a Steve Jobs movie with Kate Winslet in it where uh, there's a scene between Wozniak and Jobs where Wozniak is mm. like, "I'm the guy writing all the code, and I'm the I'm the code. You don't write code. You don't do design." Why do you? Why does everybody know you and not me? Hmm. And he says, "I play the orchestra." Hmm. So that's basically where anyone who aims to build a long-lasting company on top of LLMs, hmm. the the thing you need to be really good at is playing the orchestra. Like having so many things work together reliably and efficiently and correctly, and f- and super fast. That's so one of the pieces here. is searching the web and finding the right articles the next piece is knowing how to write the answer right what are the other pieces here um, picking the relevant it, relevant parts from each article too like ah article has a ton of content in it you only need a few for the query you ask mm. making sure that you write the answer in the most accessible way initially we just started off with just putting text with citations then people were like hey i want neatly formatted answers I want markdown in it. I I want like code to be rendered in a specific way. I want images in it. I want like videos in it. Mm. Um, I might want to customize it according to the domain I'm searching in. Like, and then people keep asking for more and you learn more about the second part of Google's mission, right? Making it universally accessible and useful. So the the first part is organize the world's information. The second part is basically where LLMs are adding tremendous value now. And how do you deal with specific verticals of mm-hmm. data that are more siloed? I see yeah. one of your co-founders or one of your founding team members were fr- was from Quora. You, of course, have the Reddit data set, mm-hmm. uh, great for conversations. You have Twitter, great for debates uh, yeah. and funny one-liners and breaking news. Uh, you have Yelp. You have Google Local. You've yeah. got all these silos of data. I asked, yeah. hey, what are some great Greek restaurants? Did a pretty good job of telling me Greek restaurants in the Bay Area. And so how do you think about um, those silos of data? And ha- are you intercepting searches and saying, hey, this search is about local businesses and restaurants, this search is about something that the Reddit data set would do better with? How do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, so so uh, the part about data, like, you know, the access and things like that, it's, it's an ongoing debate. And like, I don't have like, you know, very strong opinions on what each each person should do. Ideally, if there's a need for us to pay any party for their data access, we'll do it. Um, As for how we do it, like what links we know for to use for which query, we we do like take your query and figure out like which category it is and like try to use that Mm. information to um, give you the right sources. It's pretty hard, actually. Google does a tremendous job at this. And um, we are also doing something called focus searches where in the search bar, instead of using all of internet, you can go and pick like academic, or you can pick YouTube, you can pick Reddit, Wikipedia, and you oh, can just really? yeah, yeah. So you can, ah, you can there is a drop down called all, yeah, and I could just pick YouTube, and then yeah. YouTube you have access to the corpus of all the transcripts or just the metadata, I guess, and titles. Uh, for now, we use metadata and mm-hmm. titles, but that's already amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes I can't find some videos on YouTube directly. But well, these LLMs are so good at like doing the relevance ranking. That's much better than the YouTube search algorithm. Um, the language models do better than Google's native search algorithm. Wow. Sometimes, not always. Got it. Most of the times it's equal, but sometimes it's just really good at like these fine grain. I was trying to find a video of like, oh, so what, what, there's this scene in this movie I want to find for watching for inspiration or something, and then I couldn't find it on YouTube, and I come here and I get it. Uh, it's very useful for Reddit. Like, I want to, like, learn about, like, you know, the nothing phone, like, you know, who's even using it? Who, who are those million people? And then I, I don't have time to go to the subreddit nothing phone and, like, score over all these, like, links. It's very useful there. Uh, people use it a lot for Wikipedia, like, if they just want to focus on one thing. Like, I was talking to the founder of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales, and he literally just asked for this feature. Like, hey, I just want to do search over Wikipedia with an LLM. And I was yeah, like, hey, that's a great idea. Yeah. So like, I think the, I think they're building it now within Wikipedia itself. Hmm. Um, interestingly, I did a search uh, for interviews uh, with the CEO of Airbnb. Mine didn't come up, but other ones did. 
but then it came up with i did ones from the past year and uh man that was kind of a bingo it kind of nailed it uh which is a kind of a nice feeling um i really think that's a creative idea and i can see how what you're talking about is yeah. got some um there is some point to this which is if you narrow the scope or you build some interesting prompt engineering or narrowing yeah. uh and thoughtfulness you can get to a better answer yeah. so what's going to be your business model here you talked before about how google is not going to make be able to make it work with advertising there's a group of people who believe that uh the chat interface will cannibalize their existing business so mm -hmm. do you agree that the this chat gpt style interface or just the chat interface let's leave the gpt out of it um nobody owns a chat interface but is the chat interface anti-advertising or could advertising be integrated into it because on all in a lot of the i think three out of four besties thought hey advertising is not going to work and i thought i think advertising is going to work great inside of this you have your citations but you could put right in embedded in the discussion you know all kinds of interesting things so if you were asking about places to travel with your kids and i'm disneyland and you didn't make it i could put in there hey and if you're thinking about outdoor stuff disneyland also has this adventure park and they do the safari and i could have like a really ai generated answer at the bottom so it gives me the correct answer or what it thinks is the correct answer but then it also gives an ad engines answer to it correct. so am i right or are my other three besties right you decide i'm more with you here oh you are okay so firstly i think relevance can be even more targeted now than ever before i mean what what is the purpose of google it's just bringing two parties together the advertiser and the consumer and they help you connect these two par parties together with their query and link matching right at the end of the day yeah. the advertiser wants to get their content to the consumer of the content and llm can give you that needles in the haystack even better like it's e even more targeted honestly uh that if i were an advertiser i would just kind of focus on selling myself really well writing even better marketing copies with llms uh catered to the person i'm trying to sell to and we, we introduced this thing called ai profile on perplexity mm. where you can just write about yourself uh ah, and, yes i saw that and, and and that way you the the results are even more catered to you and then if you're an advertiser you can say i want to like target people who are of like having all these attributes in their profiles hmm. um and then uh the ranking will automatically take care of that so in some sense you're 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 creating way more relevant and targeted ads than ever before i don't know if you use instagram but uh, my experience in instagram is that the ads on instagram are even more relevant than than um uh, often is th that is the case here take a look at this I don't, can you see my screen Here's the query I did uh, based on our little back and forth here. Will LLMs, will the chat interface be uh, accommodating to advertising? Well, I put in here, you're the CEO of Disney Parks. Pitch me on why I should take my seven-year-olds to one of your parks. And so imagine this got appended to my previous search, which, hey, what should I do with my seven-year-olds in a city or outdoors? And I says, oh, thank you for considering one of our parks. For seven years, here are reasons we believe you'll have an unforgettable experience. Number one, a place where everyone is welcome. Two, more value and flexibility. Three, uh, disability access service. That's kind of weird. Uh, number four, new attractions and experiences. That's really good. M uh, memorable music. That's good too, actually. Uh, park reservation system. That's great. Uh, we hope you'll consider this. And then here it could have bookings and would you like to talk to an agent? Do you have further questions? And you, you could just hijack somebody's chat stream uh for your own purposes you could, they could be thinking they want to go to europe for the summer and then you could sell them on going on a european disney cruise or something and i i think that this kind of um style of advertising where a company ceo starts a discussion with you in chat gpt uh and in a in a chat interface uh is going to be magical yep and, and and like you said, you know, you can give you an uh, I can give you an answer that's sort of neutral and unbiased and does, it's not targeted at you. And I can also say, by the way, in case you were actually looking for something very much to you, 
And if you already shared that information with us, fully transparent and you're in control, uh, we're not going to do it in a creepy way like Facebook. Then um, we should be able to give you the answer. Uh, we should be able to help the advertiser sell, uh, sell to you even, even better, right? So I think basically I'm going even more abstract first principle and thinking that uh, it's not clear how you do it in the product and how you build a business model, but at an abstract level, the point of advertising is to reach the right person to sell to, and uh, this can help you do that even better than the current system. So therefore, it should, you should be able to figure out something at a level below this. Hmm. If you're a SaaS or services company that stores customer data in the cloud, then you need to be huh? SOC 2 compliant. You knew that from a third party and you need that third party to close big deals. And if you want to get compliant easier and faster, you need to use Vanta, V-A-N-T-A. -A. Vanta makes it so easy for you to get and renew your SOC 2. On average, Vanta customers are SOC 2 compliant in just two to four weeks. Compare that to three to five months without Vanta. And Vanta can save you hundreds of hours of manual work and up to 85% of compliance costs. This is a total no brainer. And Vanta does more than just SOC 2 compliance. They also automate up to 90% compliance for GDPR, HIPAA, and more. You can't afford to lose out on major customers. We all know that. Listen, it's a hard year. Last year was hard. You can't lose those major customers because you don't have your compliance dialed in. Just work with Vanta. Get your compliance automated and tight and tight is right. Lock down those big deals. Here's the best part. Vanta is going to give you $1,000 off. That's 10 hundies. Get $1,000 off at vanta.com slash twist. That's vanta.com slash twist for $1,000 off your SOC 2 so you've uh, raised some money uh and you're currently trying to grow the company tell me a little bit about um, what it's like to try to compete in this area for talent yeah. uh yeah. people are raising you've raised a lot of money but people have raised even more uh and there's a massive talent um uh, uh battle going on right now is it better to just hire great developers and have them learn uh, yeah. Because you're not building the fundamental model, you're building something on top of it. I, I, yeah. how, what's your strategy for talent here? Yeah, so we, we don't waste time trying to hire people that Sam Altman will be hiring anyway. Hmm. Uh, it's very, it's, you cannot compete. They have way more cash, way more, like, and they can give way less percent of the company because they have a bigger valuation. So what we do is go for these people who are still trying to get into AI, really talented engineers who haven't done AI before and want to be part of an amazing product that's growing and they want to feel the dopamine from shipping every week mm. and want to see their stuff actually being put up. And there, there is a, quite a lot of people, there are quite a lot of people who are like that, like who haven't done AI before, very talented generalist programmers. Uh, that's mm. another thing that I look for, which is are they generalists? Can they do back and can they do front end? Can they like strategize for the product? Can they do prompt engineering? Because all these are new skills. Like prompt engineering is not like a, you know, you don't need to, there's, but there's, you cannot ask for years of experience there. It's, it's, it's like a few month old skill. Uh, so you just need to be somebody who's like pretty logical and like pretty good at like getting things done. Um, you were at OpenAI for a while. Um, I was at OpenAI, yeah. Yeah. How long were you there and what did you work on? Uh, so I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I worked on like diffusion models and like conversational models for like like chatbot, like not not exactly like ChatGPT, but more like trying to get uh, another modality into like conversations. Mm. So that's kind of what I was focusing on. Um, but the reason I started this company was because uh, ever since I came to US for grad school uh, in Berkeley, I was always interested in starting a company, and. Um, I was trying to look for people who were like me before, who were like PhD students who started a company. And there, I could only find one example from the past that I really resonated with was Larry and Sergey. Mm. So L Larry is my entrepreneurial hero. Like he, he's the only reason I kind of wanted to do a company. Uh, and like, and, and in fact, in a book he's written, like he'd either do a, be a professor or he would, be, he would do a company and he would never work for anybody else. I had more constraints in my, like, you know, immigration and other stuff like that to have to, like, sort of work for a bit, get some money and, like, learn more skills. But that was sort of always there. And it's not planned, but it's just more like a coincidence, happy coincidence that I'm working on search too. Um, yeah. But yeah, the work, being at OpenAI was really helpful. Back then, there was no ChatGPT, so I, I didn't foresee the future where OpenAI is so successful. But there was GPT 3.5 and it was pretty good and, like, you know, 
we, we knew like a lot of things were happening. Nobody knew that like if you put out these models in the chat UI, the world would go crazy. That, that was very uh, unknown. So the fact that people are so used to the modality of uh, chat because they live in it all day long, this was the breakout mo moment for AI because AI yeah. stuff had existed. People were using it in the back ends to serve yeah. you up your for you page on TikTok or fill in your search query or giving you a couple of words ahead in Gmail yeah. and finish your sentence. All that stuff it was happening. Yeah. But the it needed the interface to make it work. Yeah. Fascinating. The generality mm -hmm. of the models was also amazing, but it was all if you remember, OpenAI had a playground. Mm -hmm where you could go and enter a prompt and in green yeah. text, you would see the completions, but nobody cared about like, the average person in the world did not care about it. And then no. you put it into a chat UI and then the world goes crazy, right? Huh. It makes you wonder if there's another thing that you could do exactly. that would make the world go even crazier. And I got to think, uh, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this, were Siri and Alexa yeah. Yeah. just far too early. They, yeah. they had the ability to understand what you were saying. Yeah. They just didn't have the ability to give you the right answer yeah. or any answer. Exactly. I mean, you could barely call, you know, you'd be like, oh, okay, call my mom. And it would be like calling Mother Teresa. And you're like, no, 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 no. It's not what I want. And just even getting it to play the right song took three tries. Now with ChatGPT and, and all these language models and Bard and Poe and what you're doing at Perplexity, it feels like talking to the computer would work. And I don't know why this doesn't exist yet. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. Like I, I, I have so. perplexity as running in the background on my phone in my earpieces yeah. and I could just whisper to it yeah. uh, and say, Hey, Hey, perplexity. What are some Greek restaurants near me yeah. uh, that have uh, lamb and that are over four stars? And it just gave me the answer back and started talking to me and yeah. I could take out my phone. Yeah. That would be so uh, magical. And just using the, the language models as your interface, but using voice and yeah. having to talk back to you would be incredible. Yeah, Still I mean, doesn't in, exist. In, fi in five years, I think what's going to happen is we'll we'll talk, uh, we'll we'll all wear glasses, we'll talk, and then we'll we'll see the answer rendered in, in, in our glasses, and then uh, or it can speak back to us, and we uh, we can listen via the glasses or whatever. Uh, okay, why doesn't it exist today? Like as we speak, uh, mm -hmm. I think you you can stitch together a demo uh, mm -hmm. with a speech recognition model and LLM, and then a text speech model, right? Yeah. Um, the latency wouldn't be enjoyable. Like, um, the, it's mostly on the LLM side, not, not even on the speed side. Uh, you can make these uh, ASR and DTS work pretty fast. Uh, but if you had to wait for two to three seconds, it's a bit like talking to a socially awkward person. Hmm. Like, they would be like staring at you for like two seconds and then giving you back the answer, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the experience you would get. You, it might not be very enjoyable, like how you hmm. and I are talking right now. I think for that, you need even smaller or even faster uh, LLMs. And ah, so it's not, it wouldn't have the response time that people would find not annoying. It would be, it would quickly become annoying Correct. to have it giving those Correct. pauses. Correct. Yeah, I find it quite charming now when my chat GPT interface like takes a second or Bard is kind of skipping around and it stutters and then it plays and I'm like, wait a second. And then Bard now just gives you the answer straight away. Boom. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't do the typing. But I've got, yeah. I think the OpenAI Apple app, uh, iOS app has like kind of haptics in it yeah. where it's like typing. I think it's yeah. part, it's kind of a gimmick, right? Yeah, it's not, it is a gimmick. It we, we, we chose not to do it. Uh, but there is this thing where you stream the output tokens, uh, token mm -hmm. by token. The reason we did that is because you perceive the latency as lower. Ah. Like if I waited uh, in my backend to generate the full answer and then display it like in the Bard style, mm -hmm. you might just be like, Oh, what the hell? Like, I, I don't want to wait, you know, uh, and right. then you just, I just uh, bombard you with a huge paragraph. It may not be as fun as like anticipating, like you're reading along with the model generating the tokens. That's a different kind of UX. Um, I like opening eyes choice here, but we didn't do the haptics thing because I found it pretty annoying to use when we were beta testing it. And so did the others in our company. Um, so that's that, that said, you know, like, Here's the thing with TTS, like you have to generate the full answer before feeding it into the text speed system. Um, if it's just going to read it word by word as the LLM decodes the answer, uh, it's not going to get the tone of the sentence completely by mm. saying things, right? So if there's an exclamation mark at the end, yes. you started reading the sentence. Yeah, that's a fair yeah. point. It's not yeah. going to know that.
I'm curious, you also uh, were a researcher at Google uh, in DeepMind. Yeah. Before going to OpenAI and before launching your own. Yeah. A lot of these uh, language models were based on, you yeah. know, the seminal papers yeah. on tensors and yeah. whatever. Um, and a lot of the code base was open source or open yeah. source ish. Yeah. Uh, I guess in Facebook's it was leaked. In the yeah. case of OpenAI, the original models were open source. How much overlap is there in the fundamental technology at this point? And how much is different if we were to take, you know, uh, the top five language models? Mm. How much shared DNA do they actually have? How different are they at their cores? So uh, m everything is a transformer, uh, mm -hmm. which is the architecture built by Google in 2017. Um, and everything is generatively pre-trained with language models. So all of that is the same. Mm -hmm. The difference comes to what data it's being trained on, um, where OpenAI puts in a lot of effort there compared to other organizations. Um, the reason Meta's Llama models were actually really good uh, despite not being as big as OpenAI's models, is because uh, the researchers there put a lot of effort into curating the right data. Ah. Well, explain what that means to lay people yeah. here who yeah. are wondering what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how these uh, intelligent uh, language models are built is you have this giant neural network and you download a lot of data from the internet, uh, terabytes of data, and you make these neural networks predict the next word given the previous words. You basically train them to be great autocomplete machines. And mm -hmm. by virtue of doing that, they become really good at reasoning and things like that. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that if you just keep crawling the web and scraping every page and then creating the data set, uh, you're going to keep getting smarter and smarter. Uh, in fact, you get smarter by like not training on junk and actually training on good quality data. Mm -hmm. um, and and now like um it also turns out that if you train a lot on coding uh like github and other data sets uh you develop these reasoning capabilities to an even higher level than huh. not training on coding uh, it's kind of like thinking about like let's say you have a kid uh you you send the kid to coding or math competitions uh even if they may not become the you know the imo medalist uh, they might end up being great analytical and logical thinkers in their life. And yes. that might help them in their life. So that's sort of what happens with these LLMs. And so if that's you pay a lot of attention to what data they are trained on, that helps you a lot in terms of what you can achieve with them later. So the base core IQ of these models will be much higher if you put a lot more effort into like curating the training data more carefully. And OpenAI mm -hmm. was ahead of everybody else there. Um, Google has all the data in the world, but they, they didn't mm. pay enough attention to this. Um, and uh, now, like, people have caught up, they've understood, you know, this is where they need to pay attention on. Mm. Uh, as for, like, who's really ahead right now, I think it's uh, OpenAI, like, with GPT-4. Yeah. yeah, much far ahead. Who can likely catch up? There's one more organization called Anthropic. Sure. Uh, and, and, like, they are the closest number two. And uh, both these organizations were more or less the same people. Uh, like the people who trained GPT-3 were the guys who went and started Anthropic later. Are you still using your personal phone number at work? At your startup in 2023? Stop! Such a common mistake founders make. But Open Phone has totally rethought every detail of what a business phone should look like in 2023. Open Phone makes it so easy to do this and so affordable that you have no excuse. And you really don't want your team using their personal phones for business. Why? Well, it could get creepy. People start texting people on your team. It could be that they leave your company and the salesperson has all of these text threads going with all your clients and they bring them to your competitor. Do you want to deal with this nonsense? You don't. I can tell you open phone is amazing because we use it. Our sales team, our ops teams, we use it daily. We also started using open phone for angel summit communications. It's rated number one on G2 for customer satisfaction. And let me tell you, those G2 rankings, those are dogged battles. If you win that, you really have to be the best. Twist listeners love open phone. My sales team uses it. Our ops team uses it. Customer support uses it. And uh, you know what's great about it? You can create a shared phone number like we did for the Angel Summit. 
with multiple employees being able to field those calls and texts and keep it all sorted. It's affordable at just $13 per user per month. But Twist users are going to get 20% off that already ridiculously affordable price for six months at openphone.com slash twist. And if you got an existing number, Open Phone will port it over at no extra cost. Head to openphone.com slash twist to start your free trial and get 20% off. So when you look at the open source community, they yeah. seem to be really moving fast now. Correct. Uh, Meta's Llama models yeah, were leaked. leaked, maybe, or yeah. maybe leaked on purpose. Yeah. Uh, you think that you think that story is true? That it was leaked on purpose to jumpstart the open source community? I wouldn't be surprised, but you know. Yeah. It, it was it accidentally was... leaked. <laughs> accidentally on purpose. There's some so, parallels with the COVID leaks there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a. Uh, accidental leak but they might have leaked it because yeah but this um, was actually good like it was good for the world that this anthropic got leaked i'm sorry that llama got leaked yeah llama leaking was actually really good for the world it, it you know Why? i think i think i think i think it gave more power to the rest of the world in terms of what they can mm. do with lms outside of open ai or google mm. or anthropic so that's my question these open source mm -hmm. models you've got a lot of people working on them yeah. And a lot of people are not happy with how closed OpenAI has become. Um, mm -hmm. Even I've started referring to it as closed AI. So if they're super closed and open tends to win, if we're sitting here in five years, who do you think wins? Open source or, you know, Google and uh, OpenAI mm -hmm. with closed models? Who do you think is going to win? Yeah, it, it's... You, if you pattern match open open tends to win that's that's kind of correct but uh mm -hmm. there's like a catch here which is the next big wins are not necessarily going to come from whoever is going to continue to train more mm -hmm. uh you need some algorithmic efficiencies to to make use of compute even better mm -hmm. and you need really good researchers for that ah. and the best researchers are sort of like nba players and like they're taken by these organizations uh, who mm -hmm. pay them millions of dollars a year and then if these guys who are building the tricks for making these models even better are in the closed organizations then they'll always stay ahead of the open right so then and if and, the, and if these organizations stop publishing these techniques um and these guys just stay in these organizations are paid to stay there forever um it's kind of like closing the walls uh, so the only way in which the open source world can catch up is like there are like amazing researchers who kind of like work in organizations that are actively open source models and i think right now there's only one big org that wants to do that which is meta and so as long as meta is in the game i think there's a chance for open source to sort of stay there and like you know win in the long run mm. Every other uh, organization doesn't want to publish anymore. That's a problem. Um, nobody publishing. Except for I, Meta. Except for Meta. Uh, and I guess that Google feels like they made a mistake publishing all this stuff and giving I'm it to sure Sam Altman. Yeah. I'm sure they do. Like they, they yeah. missed out on the whole revolution. Yeah, it's fascinating. No, and I didn't ask you about the paid version. What if I if I choose to pay, what do I get? And, so there uh, is this thing called Copilot. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more like an interactive search companion. Ah, uh, that it it does the equivalent of uh, hundreds of search queries for you, not just one. So you can ask it really complex queries like, "Go pull me all of Jason's investments and in all startups he's done, and like you know, uh, at what valuations he's done, like prepare a table for me and get it back to me." Mm. Uh, if the information is there in public, uh, for example, I could only find the valuation you invested in Uber, but not on Robinhood. No. Ah. So then it'll come back to me and give me that information. Or, or you can say, like, give me the year-by-year -year revenue of AWS mm. ever since its inception. Uh, I want to track it and growth percentage year over year. And it's going to come back to you with, with information. So it's almost like you're having a researcher at your disposal. Oh, wow. That's wild. For you. And ha when it, you say it's a co-pilot, is it something that lives in my system tray and Mac or Windows or a Chrome? No. It, it's, got, it's, it's on the browser. The, ah. uh, co-pilot is just meant to be like a companion. Like that, the word, mm -hmm. the user of the word is just a companion for search. It. And it's going to help you plan travel, buy products, um, mm -hmm. prepare meal plans according to your preferences. And if you integrate your AI profile with it, it's going to give you like much more detailed recommendations uh travel itineraries 
uh, web research. Like I wanted to know a lot about like when did Reed Hoffman start making money in LinkedIn? Like you uh, know, they they took a while to like start making revenue. What was the hypothesis in with scaling? All all these kind of things that you you're like not oh coding as well. Like write me a piece of code for pulling up all Elon Musk tweets to where he 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 tagged Jeff Bezos in it. And like you get the Twitter API v2 code, you can copy paste that and like go and execute it. Mm. So it's it can read documentation pages, so that way it's more factful than what code you get from ChatGPT4. So all these kind of things, it's very powerful. So that, uh, what we offer in the paid version is unlimited usage of that. Not full, like technically unlimited. It's more like 300 queries a day, which is practically unlimited for most people. Um, and then everything else is free so the way we are thinking about it is the free version grows enough that we can do advertising there and the paid version is for power users who want to like use it for work or um very complex queries that they seek but uh the free users get like 25 queries a day even on the copilot version so you don't have to pay if you don't want to we just want regular daily users to stop using google and use our product uh i will be one of them i'm just signing up for the paid version as we wrap up the episode here uh you're hiring so uh where can people learn more about what you're hiring for uh we're hiring for ios and android mainly right now so ios engineers if you want to come and help build our mobile experiences please join us that's All the right, most there important you go. yeah uh and i think you can go to uh perplexity.ai slash about and you'll learn more yeah all right, we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. On behalf of the producers and the partnership team, thank you for listening to episode 1770. We'd like to take one more time to thank our partners, Crowdbotics. Get a free scoping session for your next big app idea at crowdbotics.com slash twist. Vanta, get $1,000 off your SOC 2 at vanta.com slash twist. And open phone. Get 20% off your first six months at openphone.com slash twist. If you're looking to become a partner of This Week in Startups, you can email Hannah at hannah at launch.co. That's hannah at launch.co. Thanks for listening.